Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Thank you for answering. You're awake. <laughs> welcome to worship on this Labor Day weekend, on this very beautiful day. It is uh, an honor to welcome all of you and to welcome those who may be watching on YouTube at a different time and place. And it is always our hope that you will experience the bonds of Christian community in this place, and that you will leave here today better equipped to be followers of Jesus out in the world. We usually allow some time for announcements at the beginning of worship and anyone who has such an announcement can make their way to a microphone and uh, share with us. Hi, I'm Catherine. Last week we established that the youth will not be riding motorcycles for Kobe's bike and hike next Sunday. Unlike Bob Keller's mom, our moms are not that cool. So, if you'd like to sponsor us through pledges or donations for our Shoe Leather Express adventure, please see us in the Narthex after church. We are up to $950 after last week's generous support. Thank you. That's an awesome start. That's an awesome start. I'm Norman Bollinger. Uh, last week we announced that the homeless women who are going through the program at the Brethren Housing Association in Harrisburg are in need of five very basic items and this week that list of their needs is on the bulletin and we will allow for allow the first two Sundays of September for you to bring in your donations and then we will take them to Harrisburg. Let's fill that bin in the Northex by next Sunday if we can. This coming Friday, a small group of us will assemble 300 hygiene kits. We usually assemble them in March, but as you know, we weren't meeting then. So we're planning, we're playing a catch up now. If you've been contacted and you're willing to help us, please meet in the lower North X at one o'clock on Friday afternoon. We will wear masks and observe the physical distancing. We also begin, will begin to put together 14 cleanup buckets for disaster relief from the recent hurricane in Louisiana. Thanks so much for bringing in supplies uh, for these efforts. Um, and I wanna say, Marion keeps saying at home, we are a small congregation, but we do a lot of big things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your participation in all of those ministries. I want to introduce, although he needs no introduction, Chuck Few, who is um, with us today for the first time in a long time. Great to have his physical presence here with us today. Chuck will be playing the euphonium, which I was taught a little while ago. That is a baby tuba. It's the cello of the brass world, so uh, we look forward to that. Thank you for being here. Also, I just want to remind you that Sunday school begins next week. Please consider making that a part of your Sunday morning worship experience. The uh, adult class and youth will be discussing the issue of racism, uh, an important issue in this time in our country's history, so please Make sure you get here for Sunday school and that will happen in the fellowship hall next week. Any other announcements? Then let's worship God together.
join me in the call to worship? <coughs> we gather here where God would teach us. So we can learn to be more We gather here where Jesus would teach us. We gather here where the Spirit imparts wisdom. Please pray with me. We worship you, O oh God, and thank you that you receive us when we turn to you. We turn to you now, trusting the promise of Jesus Christ to be with us whenever two or three are gathered in his name. Teach us how to live together, to love together, to serve together, so that those around us might know that Christ is in our midst. Amen. Thank you. seated. If any of the children would like to come and have a front row seat for the puppets, um, you can do that. Jordan wants to come. Okay. Sophia and Ayla, do you want to come sit up front so you can see a little better? Great. Okay, so I, yeah, you can just sit right in there where you usually sit. Is that okay? Maybe Joel can move down a little bit. There we go. So I heard that since school started, um, some of the girls have been having a problem. So we're going to listen in on their problem and their issue. Hi Emma, how was your first day at school today? It was awful, just awful. I'm so mad at Deidre, I could just scream. I'm not going to be her friend anymore. And she is certainly disinvited to my birthday party. My goodness, Emma. I've never heard you this upset with Deidre. What happened? Well, in gym class we played soccer. She was one of my team captains. Each team captain got to pick their team. And you know what she did? She picked five people before she picked me. There I was wondering if she would ever get picked. I was counting my best friend to pick me first of all. I understand why you're hurt. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. I'm just not going to be your friend anymore. <laughs> the Bible has some advice for this kind of situation. It does? It sure does. Jesus told people that when a friend has hurt their feelings really badly, they should talk to them and try to work it out. Why should I do that? She's the one who did the mean thing. I'm the one who's hurt. I wonder if Deidre even knows you're upset. Did you tell her how disappointed you were? No, I didn't want to do that in front of the other kids and our gym teacher. 
Well, I suggest you go talk to her about it. Emma decided to go talk to Deidre and tell her how she felt. There are two ways the conversation the girls are going to have can go. Here's the way that Jesus does not want it to go. Hi, Deidre. Can I talk to you? Sure, I guess. Well, when we were in gym class, you had to pick people to be on your team. I felt so hurt and rejected because you didn't pick me until almost last. Oh, get over yourself, Deidre. Of course I didn't pick you till almost last. I wanted to win. Let's face it, you're not a good soccer player. So I did what I had to do to put together a good team. We leave friendship at the gym door. Not my problem, you're a big crybaby. I can't believe you're so sensitive. And I can't believe you're so insensitive and such an unfaithful friend. Goodbye. Oh, and by the way, you can rip up that invitation to my birthday party. I don't want you there. That's not how Jesus wants it to go. Jesus does not want us to be mean and rude and defensive when someone comes to us and tells us they've hurt them. This is the way that Jesus wants us to handle it when a friend hurts us. Hey Deidre, can I talk to you? Sure, I guess. Well, when we were in gym class and you had to pick people to be on your team, I felt so hurt and rejected because you didn't pick me until almost last. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry you were hurt by that. I was in a tough spot. I wanted to get a good forward and a good defensive players. So I went for Jack, Leo, and Naomi first. I was counting on the fact that the other captain wouldn't choose you because she knows we're best friends. It did work out that way, but I'm sorry you felt rejected by me and that I hurt your feelings. Oh, that's okay. I guess I'm not the strongest athlete, and at least I wasn't last one picked for the team. So are we still friends? Of course we are. Say, do you want to help me pick out some decorations for my birthday party next week? Then will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we approach you with reverence and hope aware that we often lack the words to express our deepest fears and our most heartfelt needs. We are confident that before a word is on our lips, you know it completely. We believe your promise that where two or three are gathered, Christ is present. We trust in your wisdom and your power to work for good in ways we may not see with confidence that you want to hear from us and that you desire our well-being. We bring to you the concerns of our community and the worries that keep us up at night. Gracious God, in our bulletin and in the silence of our hearts, we have named the people and situations that weigh heavily on us. Grant healing where it is needed. Give patience for the process of recovery. Bring comfort to those who grieve. Sustain those who are struggling to keep homes, feed children, and find work. We pray for all those whose homes and communities have been impacted by flames and floods, by winds and excessive heat. Provide what they need to overcome adversity and setbacks. Give them the courage to rebuild and the hope for new possibilities. Guide us to be neighbors who show our love through helpful actions. We remember, too, the many who feel crushed under the weight of this persistent pandemic. Comfort those who grieve, heal the sick, encourage the caregivers, sustain the teachers and educators, guide the scientists and doctors. Knowing how important community is to you, we pray to be peacemakers and ambassadors of reconciliation in the midst of racial tensions and political divisions. Show us what is ours to do to bind up rather than tear down, to unleash mercy and justice. On this Labor Day weekend, we are mindful of those who, who work in unsafe conditions, of farm workers who labor in the hot sun for minimal wages and no benefits, and of essential workers who have served us and continue to serve us despite risks to their health. 
We are grateful for all the sacrifices they make for our safety and comfort. We are aware that many of them do not have the privilege of a holiday on Monday. Somehow, God, help them find rest. Keep them safe. Let justice be done so that all people earn a living wage. God, we thank you for the blessings in our lives, for the joy of good reports from doctors, for healing and progress made in recovery, for new life, for work and volunteer activities that give us meaning and the chance to make a difference. We are grateful for love and for the opportunities to show love for this church community that seeks to follow Jesus and love and serve our neighbors. Continue to guide us so that we might be the church you need us to be in this time and place. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Thank you, Chuck, for sharing that beautiful music. Our Hebrew ancestors offered the best of their flocks and crops to honor God. We bring symbols of our labor, dedicating them and ourselves to upholding the highest values of human life. Please join me in prayer for the gifts that have been brought here in person and those that have been mailed. Dear God, use our gifts and offerings to help care for your people who are part of our worldwide community of brothers and sisters. Unite us in a community of mutual caring in which differences are resolved as we listen to one another and seek to offer understanding. May the light of your love shine through all our efforts to share your good news and offer compassion, compassionate care to all of your children. With these prayers, we dedicate our gifts. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If you care to follow along in the Pew Bible, it's page 20 in the New Testament. If another member of the church sins against you, Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Let us, <clears throat> excuse me, let us pray. <clears throat> God, may the thoughts of my mind, the words of my mouth, and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the most fun things I did in early July was watch the Broadway production of Hamilton on television. Hamilton is a multi-tony, award-winning, very fast-paced musical based on the life of Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of the United States and the first Secretary of the Treasury. Alexander was ambitious and intelligent but had strong opinions and a fiery personality. So it's no surprise that he irritated a lot of folks and made a lot of political enemies. Aaron Burr, the vice president under Thomas Jefferson, was one of those political foes. Hamilton made some negative comments about Burr at a dinner party, and those comments leaked to the press. Burr was incensed and challenged Hamilton to a duel to settle the dispute. It was a matter of honor to accept a duel when challenged, so Hamilton reluctantly agreed. The two men met at dawn on a hilltop in Weehawken, New Jersey. They walked their ten paces, turned to face each other, lifted their pistols, and fired. Hamilton fired his shot well above his opponent, but Burr aimed for Hamilton and shot him, and Hamilton died the next day. This awful 18th century practice of dueling was such an accepted way of settling disagreements that after shooting and mortally wounding Hamilton, 
Aaron Burr continued to fulfill his term as vice president. No legal charges, no punishment. I'm so glad that we have grown wiser over the years. But wow, what a waste of talent and potential and life that practice of dueling was. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus teaches us a way to settle disputes that recognizes the value of human life, the power of love, and the importance of relationships. The scripture Dottie read gives us the procedure to maintain healthy relationships in our personal lives and within the church community. Most scholars agree that these words were probably not spoken directly by Jesus. But Matthew captured the importance Jesus placed on relationships within a community. We know that community was a priority for Jesus. When Jesus began ministry, the first thing he did was build a community of disciples. And he lived and worked in this community. And Jesus set some examples for how to keep that community healthy. If you recall, he set Peter straight and cleared the air when Peter refused to accept the notion that Jesus would die. Jesus resolved a conflict between James and John and the other disciples about who was the greatest as soon as he heard about it. And he demonstrated the importance of showing love to those who hurt us when he knelt and washed the disciples' feet, including Judas. Many of Paul's letters were written to churches experiencing conflicts over things like who and how one could become a follower of Jesus, over what to serve and how much to eat at meals, over who was most important, over the correct understanding of Jesus, of who Jesus was. And that list of conflicts could go on. Matthew no doubt included these words in his gospel because he knew of strong differences of, of opinion among the believers in the early church communities. And Matthew knew that the early Christian churches had to be strongly united in order to weather the persecution and the jeering and the prejudice that they experienced. They had to be united in order to spread the good news of Jesus and invite folks into a different way of living. Jesus, Paul, and Matthew all knew that communities can't be strong when there is conflict between members. Relationships can't be strong when there is unresolved conflict. The advice we get in Matthew 18 for resolving disputes is sound and wise advice and is still relevant and recommended by lots of counselors today. But what frustrates me is that we don't use the good instructions in these scripture verses. We do anything but that and instead choose unhealthy ways to deal with breakdowns in our relationships. Instead of taking the steps Jesus recommended to solve differences, some of us bury our hurt. We pretend the offense never happened and hope that our pain will just go away. But it rarely does. The pain follows us everywhere and the wounds are always there, flaring up and hurting us when we least expect it. Another commonly used alternative to Matthew 18 is to talk to everyone else about the problem but the one who has offended us. And this is actually a form of getting revenge. We use every chance we can find to tell everyone else about how awful or thoughtless or rude or, or, or irresponsible our offender is. And my, how we love to do this over and over again with each sympathetic ear that will listen. We get revenge by forming a circle of supporters and creating an us versus them scenario. And this us versus them scenario has the power to become a duel that can bring death to a community. 
Another unhealthy way we respond to hurt feelings is to give the person who has offended us the cold shoulder. We might withdraw from the friendship or move to a different seat in the sanctuary so we can avoid running into them. And worst case scenario, we stop coming to church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that people stopped coming to church because somebody did something or said something that offended them. That's exactly what Jesus wanted us to avoid. Withdrawal from the community, division, distance in relationships. Jesus gives us these instructions so we can avoid cracks in the bonds of human, of Christian fellowship that leave us feeling distant from one another, isolated and even bruised, and that can fracture a community. Barbara Brown Taylor relates a description of hell from the book The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Lewis says that hell is like a vast gray city, a city inhabited only at its outer edges, with rows and rows and rows of empty houses in the middle. They are empty because everyone who once lived in them has quarreled with neighbors and moved. Quarreled with new neighbors and moved again, leaving streets full of empty houses behind them. Lewis says that, that that's how hell got so large, because it is empty at the center and inhabited only on the fringes. Everyone in hell chose distance instead of talking through their differences. They were not willing to do the work that was required to keep harmony in a community. I've spent some tr time trying to figure out why we're so resistant to using these healing instructions and so willing to reside in Lewis's idea of hell. And if, and if we can overcome that resistance, we have the chance to reconcile, to know peace in here and among us, and to live in communities that flourish. So here are some things I think may be at work. I know some folks who tried to practice Matthew 18, and instead of achieving reconciliation, they felt demeaned and attacked by the one who had offended them. The hurt they experienced was dismissed by the one who caused them pain. We saw this illustrated in the puppet skit when Emma dismissed Deidre's feelings and began to criticize her instead for being too sensitive. Emma became defensive and went on the attack. When this happens, it's an indication that we've lost sight of Matthew's real purpose in these instructions. Matthew's intent is not for us to go to one another to judge or criticize. Matthew's intent is not to engage in a duel of words and establish a winner or a loser or determine who is right and who is wrong. Matthew's instructions are intended to repair a relationship, to build and maintain honest honest, trusting, loving relationships, which are the foundation of a healthy and strong community. So instead of being defensive and attacking the one who has come to us, we need to listen far more than we talk. I don't know if you picked it up, but Matthew uses the word listen four times in these verses. And instead of approaching the one who has heard us with accusations, we need to go to them with humility and honestly name our hurts. Some folks resist following Matthew's instructions because they think they are unworthy of expressing a hurt to someone they may regard as an authority or a person with power. 
oh, I could never go talk to them. That's my boss. That's my Sunday school teacher or my pastor. But just prior to this particular scripture, Jesus was discussing the importance of caring for the little ones, which means the vulnerable, the ones who have little power. And then Jesus continued with the story of a shepherd who has a hundred sheep but discovers one is missing. So he leaves the 99 and goes in search of the one. Jesus concludes that story by saying, it is not the will of your father that one of these little ones should be lost. And then Jesus proceeds with the instructions in today's scripture. Instructions about how to keep each little one in the fold. So these instructions are meant especially for those of us who are reluctant because we don't think our feelings matter or because we're not important enough to voice our pain. Jesus wants each of us, each little one, to know safety and security and to feel like loved and cherished members of the flock. Some others have tried to use Matthew 18 and nothing changed in the relationship, so why bother trying again? And sadly, there are relationships that will just not change, that cannot be healed. We are human, and the people in our lives are human. And sometimes past wounds, mental health issues, and even sin make reconciliation almost impossible. When that's the case, Jesus tells us to treat those folks like Gentiles and tax collectors, to let them be at a distance, but to keep the door open for reconciliation. Jesus has promised to be in the midst of our reconciliation attempts. He's present when we meet, loving and forgiving anyone who has made a mistake and done something wrong. He is present, giving courage and strength to the one who has been hurt giving humility and a desire to listen to the one who has offended. One biblical scholar wrote, when two alienated Christians come together to work toward reconciliation, despite all the anger and hurt that separate them, they are humbled and strengthened by the awareness that Christ is in their midst. It is for Christ's sake that they search for a solution to their problem. And that's the key. It's for Jesus' sake that we seek reconciliation. It is to honor and serve Jesus that we use Matthew's instructions and work to serve the problems in our relationships and communities. I don't have to tell you, but we live in a world that is overrun with conflict. Conflict over absolutely everything, really. Politics, wearing masks, whether to have school or not, whether people can go to sporting events. Conflicts over racial justice and the priorities for how we spend our government money. And that, we could be here all day naming the conflicts that are swirling around us. And you also know that there's conflict in our churches over things like paint colors for walls, whether to meet in person or not, over music and theology, and a big one, the interpretation of scripture. What makes us Christian, however, is not whether we fight or disagree or hurt each other. It's how we deal with that reality of being human. We Christians are called to do things differently. We are called to overcome our resistance to Jesus' instructions and repair our relationships Jesus' way. The way of love, 
that heals and restores relationships and builds strong communities. And may that be so for all of us. Amen. From where we are to where you need us, Christ be beside us. From what we are to what you can make of us, Christ be before us. From the mouthing of generalities to making signs of your kingdom, Christ be beneath us. May God surround you with God's presence. May the Spirit of Christ inspire us with purpose and fill us with love. Amen.